Now there arose a king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. That's how the book of Exodus begins, a few verses into it, with almost a haunting kind of foreshadowing of what is about to take place. Now Joseph, as most of you know, was the son of Jacob, or later called Israel, who had 12 sons. And Joseph was that son who was betrayed by his brothers, sold into slavery, thrown into prison, but miraculously he made it to the second in command of the most powerful empire of the era, Egypt. In a story that only God could write, God reunites Joseph and his family after years of their separating. And because Joseph was so integral to his nation, the Pharaoh of Egypt welcomed the Israelites into his country and actually set apart the choicest plot of land for the Israelites to live in, the land of Goshen. But that Pharaoh dies. Joseph dies. Generations go by and now there's a new Pharaoh in town who doesn't remember Joseph, nor the promise of protection that his grandfather's father, father, whoever it might have been, how far down the line it may have gone, he doesn't remember that promise that he had made with Israel's family. He views these Jews as interlopers, as threats to his kingdom because he saw how much God has prospered them. So he begins to deal harshly with them, scripture tells us. I don't know how it all began, and I started thinking about how the dealing harshly with the Jews began. I wonder if it was a slippery slope of revoking one liberty after the other, after the other, after the other, until uh, eventually there was no liberty at all, and they found themselves as slaves. Or I wonder if the armies of Egypt just swept through the land of Goshen and took them all captive one night. We don't know, but Pharaoh sets taskmasters over them, and he enslaves them to build his empire. But still, the Israelites grew. Even in bondage, even in slavery, they grew. So Pharaoh commanded that the midwives who attended the Hebrew women at childbirth should abort any boy that was born. But these were no ordinary midwives. Scripture tells us that they feared God and they valued every child's life. So they delivered the boys even in the face of pressure, from the most powerful man in the whole world. Folks, honestly, sermons and songs ought to be composed about those two women, Shifra and Pua. <laughs> so don't name your children Pua, that's really sad. But these two women, they, they live tucked away in Exodus, almost in anonymity. Very few of us know anything about but they stood when everybody else was, was bowing down. Well, Pharaoh is so angry that he passes a new law that commanded all boy children to be thrown into the river. We assume that this law was carried out except for one, or at least we're only told of one. Amram and Jochebed have a son, and they have chosen rather to obey God rather than man. When Miriam was probably a preteen, and Aaron was just a toddler, this child is smuggled into this world, and his parents and siblings keep it quiet for three months. Can you imagine the constant fear that this family lived under? With every cry, and I don't know about you, (laughs) and how your children were raised or when they were around three months old, but you can easily, more easily count the silences than you can the cries. Every time he cries, they attend to him quickly until finally they they fear for his and their own lives because it's just too difficult to keep him quiet. So Jochebed makes a little boat for him. She sets Miriam bent in the bulrushes as a watch over him. And she lets her little boy go down a river as three months old until finally Pharaoh's own daughter notices this child, recognizes him him as a Hebrew child, 
And scripture says, for compassion's sake, she raises him in her own privileged home, and there is no commentary in scripture about her father's reaction. I so wish there were. It's just stated as fact that he is raised in Pharaoh's household, this Hebrew child. She calls this child Moses, which means drawn out because she pulled him out of the water. But I hope you know that there's a bigger game afoot here. This is more than just being drawn out of the Nile. Moses wasn't just drawn out of water. He was drawn out of Israeli enslavement. He is raised in Pharaoh's own household. And we assume with all of the education and all the luxuries that come with it, that's not an accident. But when Moses is 40 years old, he takes things into his own hands and he murders an Egyptian who had assaulted one of his own Hebrew relatives. Now at first, Moses thinks that his secret is safe among the Israelites. He doesn't even know if they saw him, but he thinks if they did, then they won't tell anybody. But very soon after, they begin taunting him with their insider information, knowing that he has killed and buried an Egyptian earlier. And so Moses runs. I mean, this boy runs far. He runs all the way to Midian, 285 miles away from Egypt, he runs. And for more, and for 40 more years, Moses, the only boy in the Hebrew nation his age, Moses, who had been miraculously saved from a river, Moses, who had been gifted all the knowledge of the pharaohs, what does he do? He shepherds sheep. I'm not trying to talk down to any particular occupation. There is nobility in any work. But Moses had to know that God had created him for more and had expected more from him than just leading sheep. He had saved him out of too much stuff to waste away on the backside of the Midian desert. I I used to tell our students all the time when I would talk about Moses' example with them, I would say, there's nothing wrong with leading sheep. Nothing wrong with leading sheep at all, unless God has called you to lead people. Moses is hiding out, knowing that God has called him to much more in his life, and he's choosing rather to lead sheep. It's here in the deserts of Midian, very near to Mount Horeb, the mountain where the Ten Commandments will soon be given, that I want us to settle in this evening. I want you to put yourself in Moses' sandals, or I guess really take your sandals off with him, when this 80-year-old senior citizen is looking out over his sheep one day, counting heads, scanning the horizon for predators, when something in the distance catches his eye. Verse 2, And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So Moses looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire but the bush was not consumed. I imagine imagine that Moses stood and watched it for some time before he finally realized that this bush was not burning up. That's not ordinary. You nor I have seen anything like that. And Moses didn't know when he would get a chance to ever see it again, so he headed that way, verse 4. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, and Moses said, here I am. Now, just to recap so far, (laughs) the bush is burning. That's probably out of the ordinary. It's not something that you would normally see. But the bush is not burn up. That's very out of the ordinary. Then the bush talks to Moses. That's extraordinary. But then Moses holds a conversation with the bush And extraordinary is miles away. Like, I mean, that is so far gone. They're way past anything like that. 
But really, when what God has to say through this bush is the most extraordinary thing of all because it's here. From that bush that we are introduced to the second name of God in our Sunday evening series about the names of God, Jehovah. Now, in this burning bush passage, the message that God wants Moses to hear is simple. I want to use you. That's the message. I want you. I want to use you. So for the next few minutes, God tells Moses to leave Midian, to go back to Egypt, to confront Pharaoh, who was probably kind of like a half-brother to him since they were raised in the same household. And he tells him to command the most powerful man on earth to let his people go. That's a lot to swallow for Moses. And he stammers all over what God is calling him to do. But be careful that you don't judge Moses too harshly. You see, we question God when he urges us to invite a coworker to church <laughs> or when he impresses upon us the need to share our faith with a stranger or, even more difficult, with a family member. What God is calling Moses to do is complete and total life change that we cannot fathom. He is asking him, or he is commanding him, excuse me, stop running. Essentially, you've done that for 40 years and it's gotten you nowhere but lost. Own up to the call that you obviously have on your life. Go back to where you are wanted for murder and stand up for God's people. That makes sharing our faith with our neighbor so easy in comparison, doesn't it? And what is the first of several excuses? excuses? Moses claims ignorance. Specifically, if the children of Israel ask him by whose authority he's calling for their liberty, he's not going to know how to answer them. Notice it's almost as if Moses doesn't want to know who's asking him to do this because he just states it as a fact. He doesn't ask, what is your name? Verse 13, Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And God said, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Moreover, God said to Moses, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial to all generations. I am. What kind of name is that? (laughs) That had to have been the first question that comes through Moses' mind. I have never heard a name even remotely close to I am. It almost sounds like a bad Abbott and Costello routine. Who's on first type thing. Now there's a lot that goes into this, and I'd be kidding myself to think that I could do justice to this name in a thousand sermons, much less just one. But what I want us to do this evening is just to kind of introduce to you this name Jehovah, so that you can recognize it in your own study all throughout Scripture. In verse 14 of Exodus 3, God relays his personal name to Moses. Last week we talked about Elohim. Elohim was God's name that we, uh, that it's more like a title, creator, I am is his personal name. I wouldn't go so far as to say a nickname, but it is his first name. And whenever God says, I am, what he gives is a four-letter name in English, Y-H-W-H. Y-H-W-H. 
Now, we don't know how that's pronounced because the scribes who copied Scripture treated it with such reverence, reverence that they really only referenced it in partial, in just partially. You'll kind of see this idea today still among some of our Jewish friends. I don't know if you have any, but I, I had one who he would never write out G-O-D for God. He would write G-D, treating the name so holy that he didn't even want to write it out in its entirety. The Jews, the scribes, they wouldn't even speak the name lest it become too familiar with them or unless they would use it haphazardly. So they used other names, euphemisms, when they spoke of Jehovah. Now, unlike us, they took the third commandment seriously. Do not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. And I say unlike us, to our shame. Because there are many Christians who on the regular disobey the third commandment and take the name of the Lord, their God, in vain. When God commands us to not take it in vain, he is saying, don't use my name flippantly. Don't use it as an expletive. Don't use it invoking a curse. Certainly, don't do that. Treat it well. It is knowledge that you would not have known about me had I not spoken it to you. And do not take that lightly. Now over time, back to the practical side of this name, vowels have been added in an effort to kind of help us with the pronunciation To where we now have Y-A-H-W-E-H. And we would usually pronounce that as Yahweh, but that's really just an educated guess. No one really knows how to say it. Through transliterations and translations, we've come to the more English version of this Jehovah. Jehovah seems to be the Lord's most favorite name for himself. It's since found about 7,000 different times throughout Scripture in various different forms. Usually, in those 7,000 times, it stands alone, Jehovah. But oftentimes, it's coupled with other names. For instance, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Nissi, etc. We're going to study several of them on Sunday evenings. There's a part of me that really wishes that our English translators would have left God's names stand on their own, untranslated. So what I mean by that is I wish they would have, instead of just inserting God, I wish they would have left it Elohim. I wish they would have left it Yahweh, uh, uh, Jehovah. But in order for a more clear understanding, they usually translate it to God, Lord, in different titles. But they have, thankfully, left for us a clue throughout our Bibles to let us know when times in the original language, when the name Jehovah, God's personal name, is used. Anytime you see Lord, in all caps, L-O-R-D, that is, you could go ahead and insert the very personal name of God, Jehovah. If it's lower caps, with only a capital L, it's usually some other word. But any time that it's L-O-R-D, all in caps, go ahead and insert the name Jehovah. Exodus 3, it's not the first time that Jehovah is used or called in the Bible. That comes much earlier in Genesis chapter 2, verse 4, when the author writes and says, this is the history of the heavens and the earth when they were created and the day that the Lord, Jehovah, God, made the earth and the heavens. Strangely enough, I was reading Strong's Concordance, which those of you who are familiar with that, it's not really something that you read, but I was referencing it this week. And and Strong, he pointed out that more than likely, Adam called God by his personal name, Jehovah. Imagine that if that is the case. 
as if walks in the cool of the day in paradise with your creator were not enough, Adam calls the very personal name of Jehovah to God. There isn't any kind of lofty use of proper titles. There's no Mr. Jehovah. There's no anything like that, Sir Jehovah. There's no decorum enforced. He is calling God by his personal name, and I can't think of a better testament to the perfection that was in the garden before the fall. They're not equals, but they certainly have a good relationship. That was Genesis 2, 4. That was the first time Jehovah was used in Scripture. But Exodus 3, this passage, is so important because this, this is God's introducing himself to Moses by this name. And by extension, he's introducing himself to us by this name. Now, how do you define Jehovah? Or, or in other words, how could you really explain the name I am? The commentators, they do a, a pretty good job of trying to convey it in its most base form, a defining of the, the word, the name Jehovah, as the self-existent one. But there is with this name what Francis Schaeffer called the holy disconnect from God and man. As I said earlier, man can know nothing about God unless God tells him about himself. We can't think totally about God. He has to break through the revelation barrier and tell us things about himself. So we only know what Jehovah means by what God says what Jehovah means. By calling himself I am, God is affirming to Moses that he exists. Now hold on. I know this sounds a lot like Elohim already, but just wait. Moses needed to be reminded of God's existence because for the majority of his life, two-thirds of his life, he lived 120 years and he is 80 years old at this point in the backside of the desert in Midian. For two-thirds of his life, he lived as if God did not exist. In spite of Looking back on his story in Exodus 1 through 3, you can see all the providential fingerprints of God all throughout it, from his being saved alive as a child to withstanding crocodiles and whatever might have come in that river at a three-month-old. All of that was God working in Moses' life to keep him safe. But Moses, for the most part, lives as though God does not exist. When he sees injustice in the world, an Egyptian beating one of his Hebrew relatives, he takes matters into his own hands. He doesn't cry out to God. He murders and then runs. But not only is God saying that he exists, he is also saying that he is not dependent upon anything to exist. I am. What God is saying is, frankly, he is he was not created. He doesn't need sustenance or oxygen or shelter or anything else. He is. I am also speaks to his immutability. That he is never changing. We sang of it already this evening in our song. My mom used to always tell the story about how her pastor would oftentimes on Sunday evenings ask the congregation to stand up and quote or read uh, their favorite Bible verse. And there was an elderly lady, I cannot recall her name, my mom could probably tell you. But my mom said that every single time, every single time, that there was a moment when that was kind of encouraged in the congregation, this elderly lady would stand up and she would quote Hebrews 13, 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday today and forever. Now, when I was younger, I used to not really get the preciousness of that verse. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. In my thinking, change was good. It meant birthdays and driver's license and graduation and marriage. But in my old age, <laughs> 
really having children, seeing change happen every day, watching as our culture implodes under so much change, I see the beauty of Jesus Christ is. He is the same yesterday, today, forever. The shifting sands of time do not empty his foothold. Jehovah is. For Moses, that meant that a Pharaoh coming to power who didn't know Joseph was of no consequence to this God. Jehovah wasn't intimidated by him, his children, or his grandchildren who now occupied Egypt's throne. To the Hebrew slaves, the idea of a personal God who is independent upon anything else in this world would have been foreign to them, to say the least, because their lives were utterly dependent upon Egypt's land, upon Egypt's laws, upon Egypt's citizens, upon Egypt's ruler. They had no will of their own. They were completely dependent upon Egyptians. But not Jehovah. He is sustained no matter what happens in this world. Jehovah speaks to all of this and so much more, but this evening I want us to end with a more devotional thought on this name of our God. I I hesitate to ask you to turn there because it's so familiar. I really struggled with ending this way. Sometimes we just read right over or we just quote this passage of scripture just going like that because it's so well known. But turn to Psalm 23. You know as well as I Moses is not the author of Psalm 23. David is. He's the writer of this song. And we know who David was. He was the king of Israel. But here we see David in his previous occupation, one of shepherd. And like Moses, David knew what it was like to stand out in the field or in the desert, to herd the sheep, protect them from from predators. He knew the whole nine yards. He knew everything about what it meant to be shepherding. I have no idea where David was whenever he wrote this beautiful psalm. He may have very well been out in the field, sheep, sheep, very near him, as he pens these words. He's the author. There's no doubt about it. But can we, for this evening... Apply Psalm 23 to Moses. Notice with me as we read Psalm 23 that whenever Lord is mentioned in this text, it's in all caps. This is Jehovah, the personal name of God. And here is Moses. He's been called to forsake his flock and lead the children of Israel, but Moses still needs to be led by Jehovah, and so do we. Psalm 23. Jehovah is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of Jehovah forever. Can I, phrase by phrase, kind of superimpose this onto Moses' life? Jehovah is my shepherd, which means he leads. 
Jehovah is going to lead Moses by a pillar of smoke by day and a pillar of fire by night. Jehovah is going to provide for his children to the point where even 40 years in the desert will not wear out their clothes or their shoes. Surely, the people of God will not want. Jehovah will let Moses see the promised land flowing with milk and honey. That's where Jehovah will lead Moses into green pastures. Jehovah will lead him beside still waters. In fact, Jehovah will make bitter waters sweet at Marah. Jehovah restores Moses' soul, which means that time after time, he will be ministered to by his personal friend Jehovah when all of his resources have been depleted and when all of the people buck and rail against him and all of his heart is wasted in leadership, Jehovah restores his soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness. Joseph, Jehovah will show Moses how to lead through the godly counsel of Aaron and Hur and Joshua and Jethro for his namesake. Jehovah will hear Moses' prayer and not destroy Israel so that the name of God will be made famous throughout the land. Do you remember that? When God said he would destroy Israel and make from Moses a great nation, and Moses, we talked about it on Sunday school this morning just a bit, Moses had to ask God, don't destroy them for your name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Friends, Jehovah is going to pass over Moses and the children of Israel while everyone else suffers in the valley of the shadow of death on that last plague. The blood being applied, he will pass over them. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Think of the number of times that Jehovah is going to use Moses' rod, time after time after time. And we know the power is not in the actual rod, it's in the power of God, but God still uses that staff, and in some amazing ways, he turns it into a snake to confound the magicians of Pharaoh, to freak himself out, actually. He'll use that staff to part the waters. He'll use it to rally the troops on the mountain while Joshua's battling in the valley. Your rod, your staff, they come from me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. Jehovah will provide a meal for Moses and the children of Israel in the desert via crazy ways. <laughs> Quail and manna. Food will literally drop from the sky for his people. That's the kind of table that the Lord will set for his people in the presence of their enemies. The psalmist said, my cup runs over. Jehovah is going to cause water to flow from a rock twice in the middle of the desert. That's a cup running over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord, in the house of Jehovah, forever. You know how Moses dies. Actually, you don't. We don't. It's that God takes him, or God takes his body. And no one knows where he's buried. And the idea being, Moses only got to see the promised land from afar, but he got to experience the, the true promised land with Jehovah. And so he could say, surely goodness, and mercy, undeserved favor. Moses doesn't deserve a bit of it. He ran from Jehovah for two-thirds of his life. It's going to follow him all the days of his life. 
And now Moses dwells in the house of Jehovah forever. And I encourage you, you could personalize Psalm 23 just as easily. It's in this most famous of the Psalms that we see the personal aspect of our God. Not in that he just gives us his name, that's personal. But that he reveals himself as the one who goes with us through the storm and carries us out on the other side that we may dwell with him forever.